It's the Skeptic Show. With tonight's special guest star... Soul-crushing pessimism. Bitch, where's my money? If you want to help me out, you can subscribe to me on Patreon, which is Grimachu, on Subscribestar, which is grim Jim, or if you want to make a one-off donation to help support me and keep the channel going, you can do so at paypal.me, jdesborough. Thanks. Maggots, Michael. You're eating maggots. How do they taste? Hello, and welcome to And Science. If there's one thing in this divided and contentious world that most people can at least agree on, it's that vegans, particularly evangelical vegans, are super annoying. Barely a day goes past without one of their posts popping up on social media berating you for eating animals or you know, liking bacon or whatever else and telling you that the only way to save the world is veganism. Now, that's woefully naive and childish as an approach to saving the world for a few reasons. I'll briefly skim over those. For one thing, the requirement of food that you would need from vegan sources would go up. You need more material, so the land saving isn't quite as big as, as they might think. They're also often advocates for things like organic farming and so on, which have yields about a third less than conventional farming. Without animals, we also lack manure, which means we more heavily depend on chemical fertilizers, many of which are derived directly or indirectly from fossil fuels. So that's a problem. Enormous crops of the kinds that would need to be grown, and grown intensively, are particularly vulnerable to blight, disease, and pests. So we would be even more at the mercy of planet Earth <laughs> than we already are, unfortunately. There's also the fact that you can raise animals on land that is unsuited for any form of, of agriculture. You can raise goats or chickens, for example, in areas where you can't raise any plants pretty much <laughs> whatsoever. And pigs have often been a, a household staple, useful for eating up scraps and you know, fattening up for when you need to eat them. So it's just not a practical approach for uh, the whole bunch of reasons. There are also health reasons why veganism isn't necessarily particularly uh, a good idea, at least not for everyone. There are vitamins, there are micronutrients, there are essential oils and fats whose roles we're still discovering that you can't really get from an all-vegetarian diet. Vitamin B12, for example, is very hard to get and requires supplements or an awful lot of marmite. That's essential for creating energy and without it you can become weak, fatigued, your thoughts can get clouded. It can ex exacerbate a whole bunch of neurological disorders and psychiatric disorders. It's, uh, yeah, B12 is pretty, pretty important. Now, some vegetarian sources contain it, but far and away the best way to get B12 is from animal produce. Creatine is another one. Uh, that's a molecule mostly found in animal foods. Uh, most of it's stored in the muscles, but large amounts are also concentrated in the brain. It's another energy reserve, um, which makes your muscles stronger and more enduring. I guess it's not essential, but for your body to operate at its, at its healthiest and most efficient, you would need that. And it helps your brain operate and it helps your physical performance. So important for athletes and important for people who use their brains a great deal. Carnosine is an important micronutrient, again concentrated in the muscles and brain, very important for muscle function, um, and it, it can make a, a noticeable, significant, a statistically significant difference in performance for athletes. So that's, that's important to consider. Uh, how do you pronounce this one? Colocasylphorol, vitamin D3, um, helps your bones. Uh, helps ward off cancer, 
uh, helps ward off heart disease, uh, helps ward off multiple sclerosis, depression, and so on. Basically, all of these things seem to mostly relate to your brain, your muscles, and your bones, and B3 is, is really important there. Uh, docosahexanoic acid, DHA, uh, brain development and function. Um, it's found in omega-3 fatty acids. Now this is really important. If you want to be a vegan, once you've grown, once, once you're an adult basically, once you're into your teens, that's okay. That, that, that's usually you've, you've developed your nervous system to enough of an extent that a lack isn't going to cause a problem. But a lack of omega-3 and other fats and so on means that your nervous system and your brain isn't going to have developed to its full potential and it's not a, it's not a be all and end all. Um, it just means it's more likely that you're going to develop certain neurological problems and, and, and other issues. So it's really important during your formative years to make sure that you get enough omega-3 and, and various fats because these are all needed to really lay down the structure of your, of your nervous system. Uh, Hema iron is a type of iron that's only found in meat. It's much better absorbed in the body. Uh, than iron found in plant foods, so we're better able. So even though a bowl of spinach might contain more iron, technically we're better able to absorb and more efficiently able to absorb it from meat. Uh, taurine, you've probably all, all heard of that. It's a sulfur compound uh, found in various body tissues, including the organs. Um, we're not entirely sure what it does, <laughs> but it seems to do something to do with muscle function, uh, bile, which is important if, you, if you're going to throw up, and the operation of your heart and kidneys. So, super important. Now, you can supplement, but then supplements rely on this whole industrial production process, fossil fuels and, and everything else. So it's kind of a, a, a false efficiency and a false compensator if you do a vegan diet, which you then supplement. We are designed by evolution to be omnivores. We eat too much meat, yeah, that, that's true, but we are omnivores. For, for a human to develop and operate at their full capacity, you need a mixed diet, bit, bit of everything, right? And that's part of the reason for our success as a species is that we're opportunistic omnivores with a wide variety of food sources that we can go to but it also means we need that wide variety of food sources, at least to be fully healthy and fit. Annoyingly though, and this doesn't come easy to say, but uh, vegans are unfortunately right about one thing. Right? The, the environment is in danger, it does have all sorts of problems, extreme weather, climate, ch climate change is here, right? whether you believe in it or not. and one of the ways that we can improve is by eating less meat because animals produce methane which is a greenhouse gas um, it's costly in terms of water and other resources to raise animals so if we eat less meat if we raise less animals if we shift our diet to emphasize different animals perhaps than we normally might eat that can make a tremendous contribution towards saving the planet. This is true. Just going full vegan won't solve it and isn't a viable solution. That's the only problem. And, and well, I, I guess some of you might be saying, well, global warming isn't real. Well, there's not a lot to be said to you, really, is there, other than... So, if nobody wants to be a vegan, what other solutions are there? One which is popular, but which seems to have created a really, really strange reaction, particularly on the right and in conspiracy circles, is eating insects. Insects are less sensate than other animals. 
bare, extremely good sources of proteins, not, local, not a great deal of fat there, very nutritious. They could be raised in huge amounts for relatively little in terms of resources. In many ways, they seem like a perfect solution to large parts of the food crisis, but people seem to be against it for some reason, perhaps due to some sort of visceral disgust. I'm not quite sure how the conspiracy theory runs. I don't really see what any government would have to gain from forcing you to live in a pod and eat bugs. <laughs> but the thing is, you're, you're not really likely to actually be eating fried maggots or worms or, or whatever else, even though plenty of people around the world do. I mean, all of these things are basically land prawns. So I don't really understand. I mean, I have a, a visceral disgust reaction to maggots. I can't handle them. But I, I've eaten honeyed crickets. Those are okay. You know, other people fried bamboo worms as a delicacy. Yeah, there, there's plenty of other examples. People have eaten worms for years. Kids eat worms. <laughs> and it is a, a good food source. But the thing is, you're, you're very unlikely to be going to your, to your KFC and ordering a bucket of, you know, breaded fried maggots. That's just not how it's going to work. It's going to be processed. So one of the ways they do that is they create a kind of flour that can be mixed with bread that turns the bread into a much more nutritious and protein rich source for you to eat. You're not really going to taste it other than maybe something a, a little bit nutty, a few nutty hints here and there. And this is how it's going to be because they know they can't get people to eat actual bugs except as a novelty experience, right? So they're going to process it. You're not going to recognize it. It's not going to be visible as insects. It's not like you're going to order a pizza and there's going to be a bunch of snails and maggots and cockroaches studded on the top of it. That's, it'll be a powder in the dough or it'll be an additive for other foods to help bulk them out and make them more nutritious. And if you weren't told, you wouldn't know that it was in there, most likely. <laughs> So, I don't see what the problem is. I mean, you'll eat chicken nuggets, right? That's beaks and feet and God knows what else, all mushed up. Mechanically recovered meat is a, is, is a fairly common thing. And that just means the kind of mush that's left in the machines after they've processed. Yeah, we'll eat all this, uh, all this other processed food. So what is the issue with insects when they're processed? It's going to be unrecognizable. You're not going to know it's in there unless you go checking. And it will make food more nutritious and it will lessen our impact on the planet. So eat, eat the goddamn bugs. It's not going to kill you. And if we can make that work, all the better for everybody. Insects are a hard sell. I, I think we can, we can recognize that. Even processed and so on. Some people's disgust reaction is just too strong for them to even contemplate and other people are paranoid the same sorts of people that get paranoid about GMOs and so on I, I, I don't know what they think eating insects is going to do to them plenty of people around the world eat insects who knows, who knows what goes on in those rattly little heads of theirs but we may end up leapfrogging the whole insect issue anyway lab grown meat is becoming far more viable far more affordable. It's the ultimate in ethical meat. It's real meat without slaughtering an animal. It's just vat grown muscle tissue essentially. And once that's viable, once it's able to be produced cheaply, as cheaply perhaps as regular meat, I can't see any reason why that wouldn't overwhelm the normal meat supply, particularly if it becomes cheaper of course. It's much less intensive in terms of energy and resources and so on. It doesn't create the same pollution problem, the same methane problem. There's no ethical issue with it because no animal is harmed, save from the extraction of their DNA or a few seed cells. And while it would likely mean the collapse of a lot of livestock, I think we would need to maintain certain herds, you know, viable populations, three times the viable population for safety of animals so that we can maintain the, the lines, all the heritage breeds and so on and the, and the different flavour profiles and effects that those have, all the different species we eat. You'd want to keep some 
as backups for the cell lines that you're growing in your food factories. It only, it only makes sense. So at least there, there would be some motivation to maintain some herds for heritage reasons, and everyone would have access to, to cheap, plentiful, ethical meat. But until then, we need to cut down a bit. And the other upside of that grown meat is it also allows for ethical cannibalism. Zang! Tal, friend, and welcome to Gore. Savage and beautiful, John Norman's Gorean saga is brought to life in the Tales of Gore role-playing game and its companion world book, World of Gore. Take flight on a tarn, luxuriate in the bathhouses of Ar, pit your steel against the deadly curry, best your enemies and place them in your collar. Tales of Gore uses the D6 system, perfect for both new and old players. You can purchase it from Amazon, RPG Now, or Lulu.com. Ta Sada Gore.